Welcome back Guardians. Season of the Deep has revealed some interesting truths about this season's cast of characters, but perhaps the most wholesome revelations have come from the Drifter, about him and his moonlight, Eris Morn. We've been getting glimpses into how their relationship has grown in the shadows of Destiny 2's larger story, blooming slowly like a moonflower in the night. These two characters have been through so much in their lives, carrying the weight of lost teammates, wariness from their closest allies, and even harrowing brushes with the darkness itself. It is because of these separate shared experiences that Eris and Drifter have drifted toward one another, eventually forming an immensely strong bond between them. Drifter and Eris are not only cute as F, but also I can 100% see them forming a new vanguard post final shape. Our understanding of the darkness has completely changed, the current vanguard are completely burnt out, and with the end of the light vs dark saga, I can see Drifter and Eris stepping up. So I'm going to walk you through the development of Drifter and Eris' relationship throughout the seasons, and also dive into any hints that they may take on more of a leadership role in the future. Let's begin. Though they have interacted and even worked together since Season of Arrivals, Drifter and Eris' relationship didn't really start to take off until Beyond Light, where they were both wielding stasis. Previously, Drifter often irritated Eris, finding his demeanor to be obnoxious and crass, though it would be his rough charm that would eventually break through her stoic standoffishness. In a chapter of the lore book regarding stasis, called To the Drifter, we get our first glimpse of Eris seeing Drifter as more than just a rat. Have a listen. Drifter, while your presence is often irritating and your odor repellent, you have proved yourself quite knowledgeable regarding our foes. As darkness appeared, you did not flinch. Your assistance during its arrival was greatly appreciated. Under normal circumstances, I would belittle you and tell you how one such as yourself is unworthy of the position you find yourself in. But nothing is normal during these times, and I accept my ally willing to see past the antiquated philosophy we have sustained ourselves on for so long. You too acknowledge the need for balance during this time of extremes. Need I remind you our actions must reflect this. Your unpredictable nature has no place here. We must remain steady in our convictions, no matter what the Vanguard or the Guardians say. Keep your ears open. Should forces gather against us, it is paramount that we outmaneuver any counter to our plans. We are both accustomed to working alone. For this effort to be successful, we must cast aside selfish intentions and find common ground. Alone, we will collapse under the weight of this undertaking, and the darkness knows how to exploit weakness. I know you feel it as well, the power stasis brings. Does it frighten you? Even though I believe my grasp is stronger than yours, I do not have any illusions regarding the darkness. It will tear through your lack of conviction faster than you can abandon the cause. I'm curious, however, as to your feelings toward the stranger. You appear as a creature of instincts, and mine remains sharp. I am nagged by the sensation that she is not being entirely forthcoming, and much of her information is shrouded in speculative riddles. I believe her intentions are true, but I cannot separate myself from the uncertainty I feel. Where does your confidence lie? I suspect you do not trust anyone, myself included. Perhaps that is a trait worth adopting. We will be tested in ways we are not prepared for. I hope you see the gravity of our charge, despite your consistent mockery and cynicism. There is no time for humor, though you may not have the capacity to process your emotions without it. It is wise to keep your comments to yourself. Invest in a journal for reflection when times are lighter. And lastly, I ask you to refrain from referring to me as moon dust. Perhaps then I can overcome citing you as rat. As we all know, here in Season of the Deep, Drifter would never refrain from referring to Eris as Moon Dust. Despite Drifter's often annoying persistence, this lore entry is even more relevant because it's the first time we see the pair seeking counsel from one another, specifically regarding wielding the darkness, in this case, Stasis. While Eris's tone remains distant, it's hard to deny that she is indeed seeking support from the Drifter. Seeking advice from someone is no small thing, and speaks volumes to just how important the Drifter is becoming to Eris. 
As we move towards Season of the Haunted, we see them working alongside one another once again, becoming more and more intimate with one another in their own way. For example, Drifter openly reveals his ghost to Eris, having it watch over her during a mission they're on together. This is told to us in the Edelon Pursuant Mark. The reason this is impactful is because Drifter almost never shows his ghost, keeping it hidden due to a long-standing defiance he has with the light, due to his experiences during the Dark Age, and also due to modifying his ghost with parts of other ghosts from his previous fire team, which he had to do to survive the unnamed icy planet. In fact, we see Eris try to find out about this icy planet in order to better understand Egregore. Eris believes Drifter is being evasive when he can't answer her questions, eventually just offering to make her dinner. In this scene, Drifter does seem to be genuine, and Eris has not quite let her guard down yet, and is still acting like a hidden spy. The Edelon Pursuant Tunic reads, Sister, you don't want to know. Eris locks her eyes on the Drifter's face. He staggers back awkwardly and shrugs. I see little nothing in the middle of nowhere, doesn't have a name, and I don't want to go there alone. But you could take me, Eris tests his defenses. Drifter brushes off the mottled fur of his shoulder guards and leans against a poorly fastened railing. Only if we take your jump ship and I drive. Eris sighs and pushes through him. No. Drifter springs after her. So that's it? You're leaving? You're being evasive, rat. Eris plucks her arm carabone from his hand and stows it beneath her cloak. Contact me when you're willing to speak plainly. Drifter calls after her, hands outstretched. You don't want to stay for dinner? Eris halts, considering what disgusting amalgamation of refuse would constitute a meal here. She glances over her shoulder. One last attempt to extract information. As you can see, Eris is actually interested in what Drifter is cooking. She's intrigued by it, but has to distance herself by saying it would be disgusting. She would eventually succumb to her curiosity and agree to have dinner with the Drifter, while also discussing Egregore. Once again, similar to Beyond Light, we have Eris and Drifter developing a relationship through understanding and experimenting with the darkness. Last time it was Stasis, now it is Egregore. The Edelon Pursuant class item reads, Eris sits, exhausted on a warm cushion in the dirt. The Drifter stands over a hazardously large fire, scooping some sweet-smelling funk of a stew from a cauldron-like vessel of hive design. Her face scrunches as he places a chunky bowl of thick greyish-brown potage in her hands. What do you find? Drifter asks, slurping from his bowl. Eris tests the temperature and flavour of this food against her lips. It is something like the stinking brine cheeses Akrai had given her on her last visit to the city, but with earthly depth beneath. Her face curls and she opts instead for conversation. I was right, they are connected, but now I only have more questions. You ask me, that's how these things go. Better leave well enough alone and head home, Drifter says, sloping another mouthful. The egregore connects points of darkness, resonates with pyramid constructs, but I cannot decipher their communications. Still, the Lunar Pyramid, the Europan Pyramid, and both Glycon and Leviathan all converse with the same distant point. What Rolk spoke to, so does Callus. It is gravely concerning. Wild, Drifter says with a whistle. He shakes his head and looks at her full bowl. You gonna eat that? I... Eris wonders if he heard her correctly, but knows repeating herself is an exercise in futility. What is this, exactly? Pretty damn tasty is what it is, first time I got it right. Thought you'd appreciate someone cooking for you since, uh, well, you were awful at it. Rat, what are you feeding me? She remembers his hunt earlier in the day, and her stomach turns. Eris stares at the drifter, mouth agape in a half-heaved gag, her thoughts racing over the things he'd claimed to have consumed. You cooked me rotted screebs? What? Drifter chokes in the stew and coughs. I wouldn't feed you that crap, moon dust, he laughs. You never had crawl dad stew? He holds his bowl to his lips, or a close cousin to it, he adds underneath his breath. Little swamp shrimps, you dig? It's a delicacy. Eris reels her imagination in, takes a breath, and sips the broth without taking her eyes from the drifter. The liquid fills her crumpled stomach with hearty warmth. She feels her stress melt away. The stew's flavour is far more pleasing than its smell. She smiles and drinks again. Thank you. It is good. 
Just as Drifter's stew warmed her crumpled stomach, so too did he warm her heavily guarded heart. And by the end of Season of the Haunted, we see Eris sharing a bit of herself with Drifter, having realized that they are, for all intents and purposes, cut from the same cloth. Not only that, but Eris and Drifter start working together outside of the Vanguard's knowledge and control. Have a listen. I received your last message. Whatever reckless plan brings you to the Reef need not be shared with the Vanguard or the Guardian. But keep me informed at the very least. Those haunted here have found a measure of peace. But it takes more than resolve to overcome one's regrets. We have both felt it. Our moment of pain can weave into the whole of our lives. How it binds us to patterns of thought and action. I have stared into the eyes of my pain made manifest. Pleaded with it. Raged at it. What face would your nightmare wear? For so long, I believed peace was beyond my reach. No more. I have found it in guiding others down the same path that saved me. But I might allow myself to want more than peace. What? I am not certain. Is joy the word? Might I find that again? You told me to live my life. There is more truth in you than either of us would care to admit. I have something that will be of interest to you. The Lunar Pyramid remains rife with secrets. Meet with me, and we will discuss what I have found. Take care, Rat. The darkness has deeply affected both of their lives, leaving scars that both of them have had to reconcile with. They are both the only survivors of their fire teams. These scars are sometimes seen, but most often unseen, and this is exactly what Eris is describing. They have clearly bonded with and confided in one another about their respective trauma, creating a bond through understanding and allowing one another to feel seen. Remember in the first entry, Eris did not want to be called Moondust, and that she would stop calling him a rat, but now she is using it as a badge of friendship and trust, a nickname between friends. Their relationship develops further in Season of Plunder, where their snippy yet friendly bickering starts to become a foundation for something more. During this season, we are tasked with finding pieces of a disciple, Nezarek's fragmented body, a few of which Drifter has managed to stumble upon. Once again, Drifter and Eris are at the forefront of understanding and experimenting with darkness-related things. First it was Stasis, then Egregor, and now Nezarek's relics. Have a listen. I kept this part quiet. I think half of those pirate lords didn't know what they had to begin with. They knew these things were powerful, but not why. Crack one open and you'd find a finger bone or a knot of old hair, Strong stuff. Smells awful. Ask me how I know. <laughs> I've been holding on to them, but I figured you might want them. Hmm. Why? I thought to myself, you know who might like something strange and unsettling? Eris Morn. A gift, then? Well, yeah, Moondust. You could call it a gift. The sentiment is appreciated, but no. You know what you possess. These relics are not simple curiosities to be hoarded. They might serve a greater purpose. And what's that? Am I your conscience? Discover this for yourself. They are reliquaries, objects of great power. The darkness moves just beneath its skin. Do you feel it? It ruptures, flows, envelops. Ooh, I like listening to you talk. And I enjoy your silence. Their playful back and forth, he reveals their fondness for one another, and Drifter seeks Eris's counsel in understanding the relics. You really start to see how far Drifter has come when he visits Eris's place. 
Once again, Darkness relics have brought them together, and Eris falls into a habit of not really trusting the Drifter. However, he consistently shows Eris genuine feelings and genuine concern for the people and Lixni of the last city. Have a listen to the lore entry, Trust, from the lore book Between Stolen Stars. It reads, Eris Morn's workspace was organized, clean, a camp stove, a burned wok, a crate of rations to keep her fed until the next supply drop to Luna, a metal work table with a neat arrangement of medical equipment, carefully kept, half a thrall's skull, a saw resting at its side, a collection of discarded chitin, a skein of hive leather, Drifter picked up a jar from a shelf, the container was filled with pickled hive eyeballs, the green dimmed by death. You live like this? Drifter asked, incredulous. Eris looked at him with a frown. What do you mean, like what? Drifter jested around the room. When she said nothing, he continued. You called the derelict a heap. She switched on one of the harsh halogen lights hanging over her work table. The light cast everything in hard lines of shadow. It is. So what do you call this? He shook the jar of eyeballs. They rolled and thumped together in the glass container before settling into a teeming stare. Eris silently returned her gaze to the reliquary. It was an unassuming vessel, its contents obscured save for a strange interior glow. Undoubtedly the scribe of House Light has examined these, Eris said. Why bring one to me? Ida ain't exactly a darkness expert. I see. She felt the grooves and patterns under her fingertips as she turned the reliquary in her hands. She felt the shift and shudder of the darkness as it responded to her touch, to her silent inquiry. She ran the pad of her thumb over the seal's edges. When Drifter had first offered the relics to her, Eris had called them a gift. Now that she had one in her hands, she did not think she would unwrap it. She looked back to him. What is your motivation for helping the Guardian? I do not assume altruism. Drifter gave her a look of mock offense. Hey, why not? Hmm, I did assume deflection. Speak plainly. Drifter fell silent for a moment, his face was pensive. When he finally spoke, his words were carefully chosen. The Elixni need a win, he said, looking away from her. After all that, the Vex, salvation, everything, House Light needs a win. And defeating Eremis will be a win? Yeah, hope it sticks this time. Drifter leaned back on his heels and grinned. Plus, always nice to be owed a favor. Don't know if Spider will make good on his, but I bet Captain Kell would. Again deflection, she placed the reliquary down on her work table. Drifter didn't move to pick it up. You sure you don't want to keep him? His tone was genuine. Eris considered this. Not the offer, but the sentiment behind his words. The implicit, unspoken faith. You trust me? He shrugged. Who wouldn't? There was a smile, slight, careful, at the corner of her mouth. Something close to delight. Then stay, be silent, and listen. I have thoughts on their utility. Drifter did as she asked. Just thoughtfulness during this season, the counsel that he seeks from Eris, and to an extent he continues to try and connect with Eris even when she is being a bit cold or distrustful of him. He continues to try and break down those defensive walls. What makes this partnership exciting is not only seeing their change in their character, but the seriousness of their development. Their decisions surrounding everything darkness related could affect the entire universe. And maybe that is what continues to bring these two within each other's orbit. They need one another in more ways than either of them might understand. And we need them. Finally, we return to our current season, Season of the Deep, where Eris and Drifter's relationship becomes even more apparent than the last. Off screen, they have been clearly sharing more of themselves with one another, meeting occasionally to no doubt bicker and to understand one another in their own way. In this season, we see less of the playful back and forth that we've been seeing in previous seasons, being replaced by somber meetings and guidance seeking. Perhaps this is because Destiny's story has become more dire, as the darkness has quite literally invaded our solar system, forcing all of our allies to put their heads together and fight. I like to think that in this little rendezvous between Eris and Drifter, they're not only seeking counsel, but also a little comfort from one another. Further, they now reach out to Sloane to counsel her, and you can kind of see Drifter, Eris, and Sloane forming a darkness vanguard, right? Have a listen to chapter 4 of the law book Purpose called Tether. 
Eris let her eyes wander over the interior of the derelict, wondering if Drifter had hastily tidied it before her arrival. Unprecedented, but he could still surprise her. They sat together as they always did when she came to speak to him face to face. Drifter sighed and shook his head, flicking his coin absently between his fingers. Sloan's in a bad way, he said. Eris nodded. And you believe my speaking to her will be beneficial? She replied. Drifter shrugged. Helped a few people already, didn't it? Eris considered this. It should be you, she finally answered. Drifter laughed at this but fell silent when her expression remained unchanged. Me? His confusion was genuine. Why would she trust me? Trust is built, Drifter, Eris said, and you have taken the first step. He was pensive. The movement of the coin over his knuckles stopped. She continued. I have found, she said, her words measured, that one is grounded by honesty, not only in oneself, but with those around you. He heaved a slow and hard breath. I don't know if I can, he said, his voice small. Yes, honesty is a supplication, Eris said. We ask to be seen. We are made vulnerable, but it is necessary to be treated with care. Her explanation was met with one of his rasping chuckles. Drifter leaned back in his seat, arms crossed. He held his coin tightly between a thumb and a forefinger. You always make something so easy sound so freaky, Moondust, he said. Eris ignored this. Tell her what you told me, she said more simply. The deputy commander's trust will not come without reciprocity. Drifter fell quiet, looking down. She could hear his breath and see the strained shiver of his fingers where he clutched the coin. Eris reached down and placed a hand on his arm. He was tense to trembling, but her touch was light, quiet, comforting. He placed his hand over her own. You know, some days I still wake up scared, Drifter said softly, even when I can't remember my dreams. That is what it is to survive. There was a gentleness to Eris's voice. He nodded, then looked up and met her gaze. Hey. Drifter said. You find that joy yet? Soon, Eris answered. Joy is built, but I have taken the first step. Drifter withdrew his hand. After a moment, she did too. Eris stood and Drifter's eyes followed her. Consider my counsel, Jermaine. She knew he would. Drifter let the silence linger. That's not my name, he said at last. That's what you let them call you. It was a small link to his past, a link to a life he had picked for himself. He nodded slowly, holding her gaze. He would let her call him that too. There are so many important aspects to that law entry, from the drifter allowing Eris to call him Jermaine, a previous name from a previous life, to Eris Morn beginning to find joy again, something I don't think anyone would suspect, and of course Eris encouraging Drifter to reach out to Sloane. Fighting the darkness is at the forefront of everyone's minds, and both Drifter and Eris know that Sloane is a valuable ally in this dire fight. She urges him to be as open to Sloane as he has been with her, revealing his truth as a means to meet Sloane on a level not many can. Darkness has touched her, and Eris knows firsthand that this is something that has a deep effect on a person. Drifter knows this too. This chapter also shows just how intimate Drifter has been with Eris and vice versa. Eris speaks so freely about the secrets Drifter has revealed to her and comforts him physically with a simple touch. It is clear that Drifter has come to need Eris, as he explains to Sloane in a later deep dive just how invaluable she's become to him. Have a listen. You're in a sour mood. Zivu's still digging into your head, isn't she? Indulging your stupid questions is a contributor, but yeah, seems to be going around. Asa blocks most of it out. I'm sure she's having a field day with whatever's in your rear view. Well, she's sure trying. But here's my secret. Ain't nobody that can make me feel worse than me. <laughs> Trust. Besides, you're not the only one with an ace up your sleeve. I've got a beam of moonlight keeping me going. Both he and Sloane have undergone a mental onslaught from the Hive God of War herself, plaguing them with terrible visions and thoughts. It's here that Drifter refers to Eris as the ace up his sleeve, showing that even in his darkest moments, he can retreat to her for comfort. As outside observers, we understand that Eris and Drifter are perfect for each other, especially after all they've been through in their lives. 
They've endured deep traumatic events in their lives and have been forced to deal with their pain while slowly beginning to orbit one another. When they finally were forced together out of necessity, they most certainly did not get along. However, over time, they would finally come to realize that they understood one another on a level no one else could meet them on. They would confide in one another, seek counsel and advise each other during seemingly insurmountable situations. And as they continued to meet with one another, a bond between them would weave stronger and stronger. But their story is far from complete. And I cannot wait to see what future seasons and the final shape have in store for our favorite couple. Is this the beginning of our Dark Vanguard Alliance? And with that, that concludes this latest Destiny Tier Law episode. If you'd like to support the channel and cannot think of a comment, you can leave the words Drifter and Eris. As usual, it's been a pleasure. This is Marlin Games. Peace.